was praying about this weekend. I was praying about what to do and uh, what to say. You know, Mother's Day, do I make a specific Mother's Day message or do what do I do? You know, how do I, you know, God, I can come up with a message pretty easily. But he was more like, no, how about you say what I want you to say? I was like, that's a great plan. I think I should do that. Don't you think? I mean, it would be really good to hear what he has to say about the situation or he has to say about your life. And he brought me to two scriptures in particular. One of them I didn't put on the, in, the, in the notes for them. But I wanted to read this to you because I really feel like God's speaking this to his body, to his people. And it's this. And it's in, it's in 1 Kings, and it's in uh, the story of Elijah and the, the prophets of Baal. And they were out there, and they were cutting themselves, and they were doing all this, that, and the other. And, and then it became Elijah's turn to have God show up. And here's what he says very specifically. Verse 37, he says, hear me, O Lord, hear me. And there's so many times that we cry out to God and we don't think he hears us. And maybe sometimes it's not that he's not hearing you. It's that you've allowed so many other things to distract you and get into the way of your life that you're not really hearing him. And in turn, we don't think he hears us. See, a lot of times we have these um, narcissistic thoughts. You know, you know, it's not a negative. We're not narcissists, but we all think about ourselves. And so many times, all we need to do is remove the distractions, remove the false idols that we put in front. If I can just get here, if I can just do this, then this will work out for me. But here's what he says. Prophet Elijah says this. He goes, Oh Lord, hear me, hear me, that this people may know that the, you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. That means at one time their heart was towards God, but something happened. That's, that was my prayer for you today, is that you would all know that he is God, the one true God, and that all of our hearts would be turned back to him again. And right after that prayer, this is what's so cool about prayer. Right after he prayed that prayer from his heart, it says this. It says, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the dust, and licked up all the water that was in the trench. And when the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord God. He is God. And I'm here to tell you today, the Lord God, He is God. He is the one true God. Now, what was interesting about that victory is when the fire came down, that wasn't the end of it. That was just the beginning. And I believe that what we just encountered, what we just experienced was freedom. But it's not the end. It's the beginning. Because Elijah then turned to his servant and he goes, Hey, go and tell the king, I hear a sound. I hear a sound of an abundance of rain. There's a sound right now. God's talking. Are we hearing? I believe that we are. I believe that we're hearing his voice. We believe we're hearing his prompting. And, and here's how we hear his voice, by spending time in the word. By spending time in prayer. It says that Elijah then bowed his head before his knees. Really, he got into the birthing position. There's some things, I could preach a whole message off of that. There's some things that come out of prayer. There's some things that you birth when you pray. This is great for all the moms today. <laughs> they know all about that. But from that birthing comes breakthrough. And it doesn't look like it's working. It doesn't feel like it's working. But what did he say seven different times? Look again. Look again. So I'd like to encourage you today. Don't, don't worry about what it looks like. It's time for us to look again. It's time for us to pick those dreams back up. It's time for us to stop holding on to the past and to stop being in the place of comfort. Remember, Moab was a place of comfort. But to step up. You may have lost that fire. You may have lost that flicker of life, but I'm here to tell you today, it's going to change. Amen.
See, here's the thing that's for sure. If you're saved, which I believe we all are now today, your eternity is sealed. Everyone's eternity here is sealed. It's done. It's set. But your future is in question. You're like, what? I don't, what, what about the predestined plan of God? What about that? Well, yeah, he's got a plan, but depending on how you respond to that plan will determine if you make it to your future. So your future is in question, and God wants you to come into the perfect plan that he has for your life. Amen? So we're going to find that. So it takes faith to do that, doesn't it? It takes faith. So I want you to turn with me with this scripture, because see, faith works by love, doesn't it? If you didn't know that, I'm going to tell you right now, faith works by love. And the only way that you're going to have restoration in your life, the only way that you're going to walk in the fullness of God is by walking in the love of God. And Jesus said something very specific in that. So turn with me to John chapter 15. And we're going to look at a few verses, and I'm going to get you out of here in the miracle of 15-ish minutes. Oh, good. Nobody said amen. That's good. That's awesome. See, your love walk is connected to every aspect of your life. Think about it. Think about when uh, your spouse says something to you and you don't respond with love. It doesn't ever go very well, does it, guys? Mm -hmm. If you're a guy in here, you probably had to say, I'm sorry, more times than you're willing to admit. It's real quiet in this Presbyterian church this morning. It's the truth. We Nobody likes to say they're sorry. That group Chicago got it wrong. It's hard for me to say I'm sorry. <laughs> Y'all like, what? Chicago? Who's that? Nobody likes to say they're sorry because guess what? Your pride is involved. Because no matter, here's, the, here's what usually happens. Now, don't shut me down because I'm about to say something really good. <laughs> what happens is you get into an argument with your spouse or your significant other, and then you know by the Holy Spirit you're supposed to say you're sorry. And you don't. Because, well, I wouldn't have said that if they wouldn't have said this. Right? This is not in my notes at all. This must be from the Lord for the moms of this house. Because I'm stepping on my own toes and I did not wear my boots. So it hurts. See, we have this element of pride and it's pride that keeps us out of the kingdom. Because we have to be right when we're in pride. Well, if I... I wouldn't have said that if she didn't say this. I'm talking to myself, not me. That's usually my conversation. Well, I, I, well, I, I said that because you said this. And then I have to go, I, I, I'm sorry. Because usually I'm the one that's wrong. Why? Because I did not respond. I did not walk in love. I did not abide in the vine. So John chapter 1 says this, he goes, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more, the Amplified says, more and richer and more excellent fruit. That's good. That's good. He goes, you're already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you, abide in me. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither you can unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branch. He says it again. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Father, we pray that you would bless the reading of your word this morning. 
thank you. It's your word that does the work. It's your word that opens our eyes. It's your word that does the breakthrough. And it's your word that you hold even above your name. So, Father, we ask that you would bless your word. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to receive your word as final authority and truth in our lives. In Jesus' name. Now, Jesus was saying these things very specifically. And I love the fact that these things that he's saying is in the Gospel of John. Does anybody, does anybody know anything about John? You would know this. John is the one who uh, was kind of like, you know, the artist formerly known as Prince. Right? He's got his own self-title. His name's not John in the Gospel of John. His name is the one who Jesus loved. That was his name. He'd talk about Peter not catching up with him. He'd talk about this and talk about that. And he's like, but the one whom Jesus loved, that's how he identified himself. And I love that, though, because he identified himself as the one whom Jesus loved. Not as John the former disciple, or John the disciple, former fisherman. But it was always present, the one whom Jesus loved. And during the Gospel of John, you find uh, seven different I am's of Jesus. And what's so interesting, what's so significant about that is that through all of the, the history past, all the way back to Moses, you never hear anyone say anything about I am. Other than when Moses was in the wilderness in the, the burning bush, and he goes, well, who do I say would send me? And God said, tell them I am has sent you. And so Jesus rolls up on the scene, and he says seven, seven different I am's. He identifies himself, and so when he's talking, they're like, what? Wait, you're talking like God? You're saying that you are on the same level as him? That was blasphemy. That's why they were so upset. And he literally says this. He goes, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. So in those dark places, he is the light. I am the door to the sheep. I am the resurrection and the life. That's pretty exciting. And if that wasn't enough, he continues on. He, he goes on, he goes, I'm the good, good shepherd. Yes, he is. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not just one or two. He's all three. All of it. I'm the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Just in case you were wondering. But what I love the most about it is the very last thing that he said. The very last I am that he identified with was this. I am the true vine. That means that there's false vine. That means that there's things that we get connected to that we feed off of that do not produce the proper fruit in our life. We get busy. We get caught up. Who sings that song? Is that Usher? Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. She said, yes, don't say that. <laughs> But we do. We get caught up in things that we're not supposed to be caught up in. And they take the time that is supposed to be given to him. I love what he says in here. He goes, I am the vine. And he says, abide in me. Boom, boom, boom. Just in those short verses, he says it three times. Abide in me. Abide in me. He actually says it, what I counted, was over eight times. He says remain in another time, and so, but he says abide. And so in that one chapter, he's saying it eight different times. You know what eight is in Hebrew? New beginnings. 
He's trying to tell you, if you want a new beginning in your life, you need to abide in the vine. Because if you abide in the vine, guess what he's going to do? He's going to start cutting you. Some of y'all are sadistic. Y'all are bad. <laughs> I'm just kidding. A lot of times we don't like to get cut on. Right? Anybody here like whippings when you were a kid? Did any of you get whippings as a kid? Okay, good, good. I was like, I'm stuck. And that's what's wrong with you if you didn't get a whipping. That's your problem right there. My wife tells me all the time, you didn't get enough whippings. I go, well, I beg to differ. My backside was a lot bigger when I was younger. Nobody likes to get pruned on. Nobody likes to get cut. Nobody likes to get told what they're doing wrong. But the great thing about God is he doesn't tell you what you're doing wrong. He tells you in a way of what you're doing right. He goes, you're doing amazing. Love you. Thank you. Continue in me. And while we're there, let's just, let's just take that little piece off right there. Let's just, hey, you know, you know all that Netflix and chill you've been doing? Let, 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 let's, let's just, let, let's, let's clip that off a little bit. Let's not chill so much, and let's just, let's get over here and watch The Chosen. You're like, oh, no, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. He, he didn't say that, he didn't say that, he didn't say that at all. But the cool thing about this thing of abide is literally he's talking about intimacy. Intimacy with him. It's literally referring to like a marriage. It's gnosko. The word no is gnosko, it means to be intimately known. Like a marriage. And so he says, look, I need to impact you in a way that you've never known before. And I want you to know something. The most important thing of all the I am's is this one. I am the true vine. You guys ever watch a movie, a great movie in your life? Anybody seen a great movie before? We got a bunch of Christians in here that don't watch movies? What is going on? Has anybody watched a movie that you've like? It's okay to raise your hand. I, I'm a movie buff. I like watching movies all the time. I get in trouble for watching too many movies. Ask my wife. She's like, you watched three movies today. Yeah, I like movies. Yeah, okay, there's a, you know, he's pruning. He's pruning me, guys. Just, you know, don't point fingers. You got three pointing back at you. Okay? No, I'm just kidding. But what I love about movies, I think theatrically. I think, you know, in production, and I think in things like this. And what I love about great movies is the beginning is usually pow. Like it just gets you right from the beginning. It draws you in. And then you kind of get a lull, and then it kind of builds, and there's a conflict, and there's a conflict resolution. And then usually at the end, the end is the crescendo, the, the culmination of everything that leaves you with something you never forget right and this is not a movie to go watch or anything but remember you'll know what I'm talking about when I say this word when I say this phrase you had me at I'm going to pray for y'all later <laughs> why, why, why is that they remember the emotional tag they remember the line of he comes in at the end of the movie, and Jerry Maguire says, I'm so, and da, 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 da. he goes, hello. And he goes into this whole detail of how he was wrong and all these things, and your heart's just, oh, Jerry Maguire is amazing. And, and Renee Zellweger or whatever, she goes, you had me at hello. It's the line that you remember. It's the most powerful moment of the movie. It, it surpasses all the stupid things he did, all the frustration throughout the whole movie. And the significance of why I'm saying that is Jesus very strategically said the last I am was I am the true vine because it's the most important thing. It's the most powerful thing that you could ever have in your life. You can have uh, the door you can have the way, the truth, and the life. You can have the resurrection and the power. You can have all the names that he is. The good shepherd. The way, the truth, and the life. 
But if you don't have that abiding in the vine, you're not going to bear any fruit. And the whole reason for your existence is to bear fruit. And so if he's telling us, hey, you need to abide in me, I need to abide in you, you can only do things with me. In fact, if he says, of yourself, you can do nothing, no thing, no thing. You can try, but it's not going to produce any fruit. It's going to get you so far, but then you're going to fall back. It's going to get you to a point, and then it's going to crumble. But he's saying, if you stay in me and I in you, then it's going to bear much fruit. So what we need to do is we need to have a protection of our connection. So if you're taking notes, write that down. Protection of my connection. So my parents are coming in town next week because my, my daughter's graduating high school. She had prom last night, and I have to pat myself on the back a little bit because I actually slept soundly while she was out. I know, right? I'm like, boom. Had my gun ready, though, just in case. No, just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Kind of truthful right there. I did get on my phone. I was like, where is she right now? You know, I did do that. I did do that. But my parents are coming, and they're bringing a blackberry vine because we have blackberries in our backyard. We have a little herb garden in the corner, and, and they brought us some blackberries in the past, blackberry bush. But if you know anything about blackberries, it's not a bush. It's a vine that grows. And my wife says, hey, you know what I want for Mother's Day? I go, oh, God. And I knew it's something that she wants me to build. So I got her what she wanted for Mother's Day, and now I have to build her also, and in addition to that, is to build her a trellis. And the reason why I have to build her a trellis in that little box that we have is up high is because blackberry vines grow. They grow up. And now the reason why they're growing up and they're because they can they can thrive when they're growing in the vine. Right? And so as they're growing in the vine, they're growing up. Why, are they, why do they need to be up on a trellis? Because it protects them from the rabbits and the rodents and eating the fruit. See, the enemy wants to eat your fruit. He wants to take away your fruitfulness when actually fruitfulness, uh, the fruit of the Spirit. In fact, let's look at this. Look at Galatians 5. Galatians 5 says this. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives joy, wait, love, joy, peace, patience, ouch, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, next verse, gentleness, and what's that cuss word doing in the Bible? <laughs> Self-control. How's that a fruit? Oh, oh, well, we'll get to that on another message. <laughs> but check this out. There is no law against these things. The very first fruit of the Spirit is love, obviously, because faith works by love. Guess what? The number two fruit is joy. Now, why am I talking to you about the fruit of the Spirit? Because when Jesus was talking in John's Gospel in the 14th chapter, in the 11th verse, he says, these things I've told you so that you would have joy. Whose joy? His joy. He says, my joy. He goes, I've told you the thing so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy, because you now have his joy. Your joy is going to overflow. Okay. Helping the, the readers. Overflow. There's a joy that can overflow in your life when you remain in him and he in you. You see, it's the branches that grow. We're a branch. And here's the only thing that's good about a branch. You can either burn it or you can grow it. We have a bunch of crepe myrtles, seven to be exact, in our house. And if you know anything about crepe myrtles, they have to be pruned every year. And they're usually pruned, this is interesting, in the dormant season. See, there's some seasons in your life that maybe you don't feel like God's doing anything or that he's working in your life. That's a dormant season. And in that dormant season, God is pruning back the things. Why? So they can grow. And all of our crepe myrtles, when they start to bloom, which they're just now starting to bud, we had to cut them down, cut them at the little fork. 
that they, you know, start to bud from. They all grow like 18, 20 feet tall. They're huge. I have to get a ladder for one of them to get up to the top to cut the prunes. I have to cut it back. And so what God's saying is like, hey, uh, you're the branch. I'm the vine. I'm going to prune these things back in your life so we can grow together. See, he's removing some things in your life so then you can have more room to grow. Every year, it gets bigger and bigger, these trees. And every year, your life should get bigger and bigger with him. It's all about abiding in the vine. See, he says that if you abide in these fruits, if you live in these fruits of joy, if you live in this love, then there's no law that applies to you. Now, that's not a license to sin. That's a license to live in love. That's a license to live in joy. That's a license to live in peace. That's a license to live in self-control. Discipline. That's what he's been saying to us. But in that discipline is how you get the six-pack abs. In that discipline is where you get the workouts. And in that discipline is how you build money in your savings account. What I love about all this is how he chose John to write all this above anyone else. We already know that he's the one that Jesus loved, right? Because he told us that, <laughs> right? He's like, I, I'm the one. But what I really love about how John is is that John wasn't satisfied with just being the one Jesus loved. He wasn't satisfied with just sitting next to him. He had to lay his head on his chest. He's like, ah, oh, it's not good enough. I just got to get closer. I got to get closer. I got to get closer. And I believe that's the heart of God. He's like, God, just, just come a little closer. Just come in a little bit closer. Just, just draw in a little bit more. Just abide in my love just a little bit more. Well, how do we do that? Fix our focus. Say, I'm fixing my focus. I've got nine minutes. I'm going to do it in Jesus' name. Pray for me. Nine minutes coming down. Count down. You see, the great thing about John is that he didn't look at anybody else other than when he talked about Peter, so he had a little bit of animosity there. <laughs> but everything else that he was, what he was he doing? He was fixing his focus on Jesus. See, when you fix your focus on Jesus, you don't see anybody else. When you fix your focus on him, you don't see the competition. You don't see the criticism. And if all you're seeing is what everyone else needs to fix in their life, it's a huge indicator that you need some fixing in yours. See, the one thing about this right now, and I'm, I'm very, you know, I don't know how, what kind of guy I am. I'm a kind of guy that um, I like to look a certain way. I want to have my hair cut a certain way. I want, And so when I'm getting in the mirror and I'm getting ready and I'm doing the hairspray and the gel and all that stuff, I'll get another mirror and I put it because I can't see the back of my head. I want to make sure the back of my head looks okay too. I don't want something sticking up over here or, you know, duck tail flopping out of there or anything like that. You know, I don't want big hair neckline track lines down the back of my neck from hair growing or something crazy like that. Um, and the interesting thing about that is that I can't see myself. I need a mirror to see myself. That's the thing about you. You can't see yourself. And so the thing is, is a lot of times what we want to do is we want to go ahead and, and, and put everyone else under a little, uh, you know, magnifying glass, put them under a microscope or some kind of a, you know, telescope. Even though they're far away, I'm going to find out. I'm going to look into everything about them. I'm going to do this, 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 this. But what we really need is we need to ha look in the mirror of the Word. Because the mirror of the Word shows us what our reflection should be like. And so what I, I love about this with John is that he's not focusing on anyone else. The only thing he's focusing on is Jesus. So we need to fix our focus on him. That's how we abide in the vine. Because, see, God cannot restore what you're not aware of. There's things in your life that God's still waiting to restore in your life, but you're not aware of because you're too busy being focused on what you don't like what you're disappointed with, what you're upset about. 
And God's saying, let go of all those things. Let go of your past. Let go of your hurt. Let go of your, your shame and all those things. And you need to look to me so then I can restore the very thing that you've been complaining about. Amen? See, what happens is we, we want to abide in the vine, but we're used to our vine, not his vine. Do they still have that little app, Vines? Is that still a thing? No, no, no. My kids are like, look, Dad, it's Vine. It's Vine. Now it's TikTok and Snapchat and all that stuff. So, yeah. yeah. So uh, it's just interesting to me because everything in your life is like a scroll or like a, how long does TikTok go, the longest video? 60 seconds? Are you kidding me? 60 seconds is the attention span of a normal average person today that's on social media 60 seconds but we want God to do miracles in our life but we live in 60 second increments now when I'm up here at church often and I'm trying to you know get in shape I'm trying to get some of this winter insulation off uh, of my body <laughs> and, and so I found this thing that I like I, I do like a macro kind of a thing um, just anyhow and and I found this pizza that I like. It's called Quest Protein Pizza. Has anybody heard of it? It is awesome. If you want it, it's like cheating but not cheating because there's 52 grams of protein in the pizza. And there's only a little bit of carbon. There's a good amount of fat. And so it's a good ratio for my deal that I'm doing. And, and so I'll get in there and I can get that pizza and I can throw it in my little toaster oven and it's ready in like seven minutes. It's amazing. But then I... Was Dana was here one time. I go, hey, you want to try this? It's really good. She goes, oh, sure. It looks cute. It's great. And she's like, <laughs> about spit it out. Because it just wasn't that good to her. Why? Because it was so shortly cooked and it was a lot of processed stuff. And, and what actually on the on the box, you know, I, can, I put it in my toaster oven. Because one time I tried it in the microwave. Not good. So like three minutes and something, I put it in there, and the outside was like piping hot, and the inside was still frozen. The center of the pizza was not good at all. It was horrible. I was like, well, I'm going to put it over here. But even in seven minutes, I was like, is it ready yet? Is it ready yet? God, what's taking so long? And it's not that fulfilling, but it's meeting my need where I am in the moment. And what we do is we allow those little things that we settle for. We'll settle for little wins, and we'll settle for little things because the time isn't conducive to what we want. And so we'll settle for this when God's saying, no, I want you to have something that's more saturated, that's more constant in this vine of connectivity. Now, not too long ago, my wife made pot roast. Anybody had pot roast before? My wife can make a mean pot roast. We found this little cattleman's place, and we, I bought this big old thing of roast, and, and we put it over there, and she puts it in the crock pot on Saturday. I go, what do we have on Sunday? Pot roast. She puts it in the crock pot on Saturday, chops up the onions, puts some garlic in there, puts some spices, a little bit of this and that, and, and she starts to simmer it. And, you know, if you know pot roast, it's dense. It's hard. You're not really cutting it very easily. You're not pulling on it very well. But by Sunday, when we get home, it's been simmering and saturating. And when I get in there, I get that fork, and I put the fork in, and it just falls apart. I can't even get it out with the fork. Why? It's been saturated. You see, we want God to do these Quest Pizza miracles in our lives when really we're settling for little victories when He wants to help let us have a pot roast lifestyle so we're saturating we're constantly in his presence we're just letting his presence simmer and soak and saturate and permeate every part of our being how do we do that by walking in love and abiding in him because if we abide in him then we're going to thrive amen see when you start to abide in him you start to find that there's a rhythm in him we have a rhythm at our house, and that rhythm of our house is this. I get up about 5-something in the morning. I get to the gym by 6 at the latest. But when I first get up, I spend time with the Lord 
I'll spend time in the Word, and then I'll start, you know, writing out some things, journaling them or whatever. I get to the gym. I work out. got my little beats in, my Power Beats Pros. I'm working out to whatever music I'm working out to. And then I come home. And when I come home, there's a rhythm. It's go get the coffee, grind it up, heat the carafe, get all the stuff ready, wake the kids up, make them breakfast. And they're, well, they're teenagers. Why are you making them breakfast? Because I want to spend every moment I can with them while I have them. And that's how it is with God. There's a rhythm. In fact, in the message paraphrase of Mark's account of the gospel, Jesus says, is there any of you that are heavy burdened? beat down, worn out on religion. He goes, come, learn of me. He goes, watch me, work with me, watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. See, God wants you to get into his rhythm, and his rhythm is easy. His rhythm is light. His rhythm will never leave you wanting or never leave you uh, without, never leave you lacking. His rhythm will produce the fruit in your life. But you've got to give it to Him. You've got to let it all go. And you've got to give it to Him. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that it's your word that brings light and life. We thank you that as you're removing those things, as you're cutting off some of those things that have held us back, you're doing it so there will be much fruit, much growth. Father, we thank you that you're more committed to our growth than you are our comfort. And so as you challenge us this week, as you speak to us to put certain things down and, and pick other things up, I thank you that each and every person in this place, each and every person at the sound of our voice, will let go and allow you to remove those things so that you can bring that lasting fruit for our future. Father, we praise you. We thank you. It's your word that brings the change. It's your word that brings the transformation. And it's your word that gives us total and complete victory. Amen and amen. Let's give God some praise this morning. Hallelujah. Remember, stay in the vine. Stay in what he has for you. If you do that, I promise you, you're going to look back on this year, and it's not going to look anything like it does right now. It's going to be better and bigger and brighter than you ever could have imagined. Amen. I mean, I love you. I call you blessed. I call you favored. Go out here, have an amazing Mother's Day, and be an encounter to someone else. You are dismissed, and we'll see you Wednesday at 7 p.m.